we're talking about some things that I have been pondering all week, and the Lord's been speaking to me. And early in the week, He gave me a one of the Bible stories, and wasn't sure how in the world it was going to fit into this talk, but it will at the end. Usually, we start out with the text at the first. I do have a little bit of scripture here at the first, and and that's the time in Acts three six when Peter was walking along, and there was a man on the ground, he could not walk, and he had to beg for a living. He had to ask for people for money because there wasn't any help in the the uh, current setup of that society. So he had to, to humble himself and ask for help. And uh, so scripture tells us here in 3.6, Peter said to him, he said, well, silver and gold I have none. I don't have any money to give you. Mm -hmm. That's right. That happened with me one time. And he, he said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Mm -hmm. And he took him by the hand and he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones Hallelujah. received strength. Hallelujah. So this wasn't a healing. This was a miracle. Hallelujah. A miracle happened. And he leaped up and walked around and went into the temple praising God. Hallelujah. And the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew <laughs> it was he who sat begging Glory. alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. So this happened. Everybody knew him. This was the local guy that sat at the gate. Everybody walked by him, right? And, and probably some avoided eye contact. Probably a lot avoided eye contact. Maybe occasionally somebody gave him a, a coin of some kind. So when he came leaping and happy in the temple, everybody knew and it was a big deal. And the result, see, for a long time I thought, well, that was a cool deal. So there's the teaching. The lessons within that, right? Well, there was more to it. There was more to it. There was another piece. Because as you keep reading the story, you find out in 4.4, it says, however, many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. We don't know that there's five, but it must have been a bunch <coughs> added to become 5,000 that were saved. <coughs> and it all started with the healing of this man. So there was a miracle followed by people getting saved. That's what I want to discuss today. The power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit and how it relates to people becoming saved and giving their heart to the Lord. And the power behind it. The power behind the power. That's what that, that's what we could call it today. The power behind the power. What is the power behind the power? So everybody was astounded and Peter saw it and he responded it to it and he said to everybody, he goes, Well, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or look so intently at us as though our power or godliness made this man walk. So Jesus said, what are, you, what are you looking at me for? <laughs> what are you looking at me for? And astonishing, and he quotes in a, Jeremiah 5, an astonishing and horrible thing. Or he didn't quote this. Hold on. Let me back up. I'm jumping ahead. So he acknowledged it was not in his power. And that's an easy thing to forget. You see, that had happened for years. In Jeremiah 5, there was a time when the priests and the people in the temple would do that. They would try prophesying. They would try all these things, and they tried to do it here in their head. They tried to do it with thinking, and they tried to figure it out, and they tried to do it on their own. And here's what God's opinion of that was. He said, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed. In the land, the prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. 
my people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? So God, when you try to do it on your own, he said, a horrible thing has been committed. Why did he say that? It's because it was their own power. And there was a missing ingredient there other than the Holy Spirit. There's one more missing ingredient. Let's see if you can guess what it is as we go along. So how did people become led to the Lord? In Acts 5, let's jump over to Acts 5. And through the hands of the apostles, so the church first started up and, and the apostles were doing all this stuff. Many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were, they were of one accord in Solomon's porch. So they're hanging out on this at this place. And uh, they were being esteemed, etc. And multitudes of men and women were being added to the number of believers. And they'd bring the people that were sick out on the street and lay them in beds and couches. And even when the shadow of Peter would pass over the sick, they'd be healed. So people would hope that just a shadow would pass over them. What an amazing power. Because that kind of power was out and about. So many people were being saved. And a great multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. They're just bringing sick people sick, people tormented by unclean spirits. And they were all healed. All of them. And Paul tells us in Thessalonians 1.5, For gospel did not come to you in words only. Right? See, some churches you have to go get a doctorate. It's been four years studying words and learning logic structures and learning oratory skills. You try to figure it out so you can talk people into things and, and you can present really well. And so Paul said, that, that's not how the gospel came. He says it right here, for a gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power. That's how it came. It came in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. So one New Year's Day, there was this, uh, there was this tournament of roses parade. A lot of times, you know, used to be at Thanksgiving. I don't really watch TV anymore, but especially at Joe's grandpa's house when, you know, he was, her big, the big thing was to watch that Macy's Day Thanksgiving parade. Y'all ever seen that? You know, have those big floats and stuff. So this is, at this parade, there was a lot of those big floats and, you know, going along. And um, there was this one beautiful fl float, and it sputtered and it quit. It wouldn't move. It ran out of gas. It ran out of gas. The whole parade was held up until somebody could get some gas out there and put it in the car or truck that was doing that thing. And here, here's the funny thing. That float, it represented uh, the Standard Oil Company <laughs> that, that supplied people with gasoline. That's where a lot of the gasoline came from, the Standard Oil Company. And their float ran out of gas. Sometimes we neglect our spiritual maintenance and the Holy Spirit, and, and we forget about being in the presence of the Lord and praying with him. And we run out of gas. If you ever run out of gas and you're tired, you know, you're weak and you're like, where's the Lord at? And you wonder if he loves you or if he's ever loved you, maybe. He always has and always will. But you run out of gas. Like that float. But it keeps you going. When you have that power and you know the Lord loves you, that love is in your heart. Paul, he writes to the Corinthians, he said in the present hour, listen to the situation he's in. We're both hungry and thirsty. And we're poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. So, I mean, life on the street's tough. Street homeless, 
Whew. Rough. And then you can't get food. You can't get even something to drink. And then you're beaten and you don't have anything to wear. So that's our Apostle Paul situation. But he finds joy. And his mission doesn't seem to be to be housed. He's got this special mission that God has given Paul. And he stays with it. And he stays with it. And he says, and he says this. Here's what he says. He's writing the Corinthians and he tells them, I'm coming to you if the Lord wills. And uh, not the the word, some of you guys are puffed up. He's telling the church, and I'm coming not with, with the word, but with power. I'm not coming with this kind of word that you guys are puffed up. You're puffed up. You've got these oratory skills. And Paul says, I come in power. And it's not that Paul couldn't, couldn't speak. He's one of the most eloquent, brilliant writers there are, even to this day. Just read the book of Romans, or really any of his letters. So it's not that he didn't have the ability. He said, I'm not coming with that. I'm coming in power. I'm coming in power. And and how do you get the power? Isaiah 40, 29, he says, he, he, God, gives power to the weak. Are you weak? Are you broken? Then you're in perfect shape for the Lord to give you power. The power of healing and the power of love. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. That's what God does. Jesus himself said, Matthew 22, 29, to the Sadducees, otherwise known as the Sadducees, <laughs> by Mark. <laughs> the Sadducees. The, the Sadducee family. We'll give you... Anyway, so he says to the Sadducees, and the Sadducees are Sadducees and Pharisees, and the Sadducees, they were sad. I always remember that. They are just sad. They didn't even think there was a heaven. They didn't think there was a spirit world. It's just like, really, guys? It's like, you know, well, whatever. And he says to him, he says, you're mistaken. You don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. They had the scriptures memorized. You had to, to, to be a, a rabbi, you had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. You guys got some scripture memorized? Can you recite the five books of the Bible by heart? <laughs> and Jesus says to these guys, you don't know the scriptures. You don't even know them. You can rattle them off. And you definitely don't know the power of God. And what is the power of God? And here's the answer in Ephesians 3. This is it. I mean, th this is what's behind the power. We've seen the power of God. We've seen miracles. We've seen healings. We've seen prophetic things uttered that change hearts. But it comes from somewhere. It comes from the Holy Spirit. But, but there's power that flows through the Holy Spirit. Where does it come from? In Ephesians 3, it tells us, jumping down to 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes a knowledge, which you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If you read this whole chapter and section, here's what, here's what he's saying, the mystery. Some people call it the mystery of God. It's love. Love is what powers it. Love is that gasoline and that float. Love creates the power of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Because Scripture tells us God is love. Here's love and here's God. But no, here's love and here's God. Same thing, same place. That's what powers the power is love. The love of God. And it's easy to forget. Sometimes we think God, some people think God is this mean, harsh, you've messed something up, so he's going to make you pay. He gets a bad rap. 
to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Maybe some better words would be to understand the fact that knowledge is worthless. You're going to miss the love of God. All the stuff that you think you know and you think you can figure out, it's surpassed. The love of Christ, it passes it up. And once you understand that, you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's the mystery. That's the mystery. The answer's right there in Scripture. So it is the Bible. The Bible, it's many things. One thing it is, it's, it, it's this practice manual that teaches us how to love each other and love God. Imagine, imagine who likes Star Wars? Anybody here like, anybody a Star Wars fan? It's just me. I'm, it, it's just me. Oh, okay, Josh, Star Wars. What's that? Okay, good. So, so Star Wars, George Lucas, you know, there's, there's the concept of the Force. First of all, I was a little kid, and I saw Star Wars on the screen when it was, like, brand new in the theaters. So I, I refer to that first movie as the original Star Wars, but I know there's some name for it, something about hope or something like that. But I call it Star Wars. So in Star Wars, you know, we were exposed to this concept of the Force. You know, may the Force be with you. And... Uh, so George Lucas, he, he actually got the plot for Star Wars from a Japanese movie called The Invincible Fortress, some samurai and stuff, and he bought the rights to it later just so he wouldn't be infringing copyrights. But he borrowed out the idea of the Force kind of from an Eastern sort of concept. Uh, so I see a lot of Buddhism in it. And so the concept is like, you know, the dark side. There's the dark side of the Force. And so these are the guys that get their power from emotions, really all emotions and you know it kind of livens it up and it eats them up eventually and they become self-destructed and then the good side of the force the jedi knights they just use the force but avoid all emotion and you know that's kind of a buddhist concept but that's not really how god works you see the good side of the force guys would have no gas Nothing would happen in reality. In Christianity, love is, there's, there's the emotion and there's the action. And that's the real thing that powers the Holy Spirit. And, and it should, and I'm going to show you why in this last illustration. But we're like a pipe. Imagine we're a pipe. Hannah made your big old pipe. It's pipe Hannah. It goes from the east side to the west side. Well, you're a pipe. And uh, I remember as a young man, I worked over at Henderson, and we had a residential program. We'd put people with disabilities, we'd help people with disabilities get into housing. And so I dealt with a lot of landlords, and I got to know them. And downtown Henderson, they had the, some of the old houses, they had like those old iron pipe, and the pipes would get, uh, they'd get all clogged up over time. And, you know, they'd either have to tear the pipes out or, couple of these old guys, see the old dogs, they know what's up. So I was talking, you know, a couple of these old guys had some houses, and they said, well, down there at Home Folks Hardware, they got this special stuff you can't buy just anywhere. It's called uh, fire something. <laughs> it's, you know, it was illegal in California like 50 years ago. <laughs> they would never allow this in this state. Whatever it was, he'd go, yeah, you pour that in your pipes, it'll clean them right out. If you leave them in there too long, it'll eat all the way through the iron pipes. I always want to get some of this stuff just to have it. I'm like, that's some pretty tough stuff. I need some of that. <laughs> but the pipes clog up. And your pipes, they clog up. Our pipe is meant to be all the way open, and through it flows love. Amen. The love of God will flow through that pipe. And what comes out the other end is love. And when need be, Miraculous things and healing happen to those around us. The, th the pipe can clog up, though, with uh, jealousy and bitter envy and unforgiveness. That's why the Lord says, don't do that stuff. It just clogs your pipe. And it can even get clogged up with the hurts that we've had in life, the, the unfairness that people have done to you. 
you know, and your heart aches in the world and shame. Oh, the devil, he gives us shame. He says, what you've done, I know what you've done. You should be ashamed of yourself. He's just trying to clog your pipe up. And it keeps the power of love from flowing through you. So, when you encounter somebody that, the guy last week and I had a conversation, I'm pretty sure I made him mad, because I was defending the weak and the oppressed. And he, and he was from church world, he should have known better than that. Now, I thought to myself, if I had a chance to do it again, I'd probably do it again. <laughs> but, uh, you know, something he didn't understand is when you see somebody who has isolated themselves, like some guy, he's got a lot of anger and, and you don't want to go around him. And there's probably a reason. Or, or, or maybe you see a, a woman who has a bad reputation and people, you know, they talk about her and nobody wants to be seen with her. You know, people didn't just pop out of a box like that. Probably, you know, and over the years I used to do therapy and so I'd hear these stories and I'd always be curious, how does somebody come to the point where they're at? How did you come to that point? What happened to you? And what you can't see when somebody is grown and scary or annoying or all the negative things that you want to avoid is something happened. Like, for instance, one, one of many things that might have happened, that you know, this happened to uh, some kids, is w when they're little, they're beaten. You know, some people are like, oh, I'm going to beat you. You know, and that means they're going to get a whipping. But you know, a beating is different. You know, beating is like when, here's what a beating is like, is when a parent has, you ever got whipped by a razor strap? Or seen a razor strap, JD? You know what? So, razor straps are really bad. It's a real thick piece of leather. It's got a handle. It's like they invented it to beat little kids. You know, and a parent, a parent beats a little, the child, and, and has a fury and a rage inside of them, and they keep doing it as hard as they can until the rage is gone out of the parent, and it puts that hurt into the child. You see what I mean? That's a beating. That's the difference between a whip. That's a beating, for instance. There's other kind of beatings. And that hurt can go into that child. And as they grow up, it can turn into alcoholism and, and beating other people or robbery or a life of crime. It can turn into a lot of things. And then this is a person that needs healing. But you can look at them and think, ooh, I don't want to talk to that person. And with women, sometimes there there are uh, women of ill repute. That's a cleaned up word for prostitute. Uh, women who have gone into prostitution. Uh, you know, and even drug abuse. A lot of people who've never traveled those roads, they have a sense that, well, you know, it's kind of their own fault. And they should really pay a price before they come out of there. They have to pay for it. You know, they need to work. They have to suffer somehow to come out of that. And, you know, the, these uh, women who is in prostitution, that's just disgraceful and horrible. And But if you ever get to know a person who's traveled that road and, and you hear their story and you ask them what happened, you know, how did this come about? It, it's usually... Uh, something where th this person was just horribly abused as a child that was so young that she didn't even couldn't even remember everything, and and it goes on and and then they learn that men are are creatures that just simply are there to abuse you so and take advantage of you. And they just learn to expect that. And they put up walls. And we see a lot of, we see several stories, I think, in the New Testament where Jesus deals with prostitutes. And he's never mean to them, is he? That's something.
So I bring that up because I want to talk about a particular instance when the Lord was talking to somebody. So imagine, you know, I don't know if you've ever been looked down on before. You ever been in a spot where, like, people are looking at you and they're like, and they have that judgment eye, you know, and you can kind of feel shame like they're injecting it into you with a big hypodermic needle or something. So, some, you know, sometimes a person can get in a situation in life where it's like everybody looks at you that way. So in the times of Jesus, um, there's a person who is like that, and she's part of a uh, minority. She's part of a no minority group. So there's a racial prejudice. And this is a woman. So, you know, and definitely women had far less rights in this culture, in this area. And she was an outcast, a social outcast. See, in, the, in this day that we're talking about, adultery could land you dead, kind of like it does in the Middle East right now, right? They stone people to death. They take big rocks and they kill them with it. And even in the, well, even in one story, we see that some men were going to stone this one lady to death, a prostitute, you know, and, and Jesus stops them. But this is, a, this is a little bit different story. There's this woman, and she's at this well. She's at the well. It's the woman at the well. And uh, so the Pharisees are kind of after Jesus. Here's what's going on. Set the stage. And uh, so Scripture says, now he had to go through Samaria. He had to go through it. Why does it say he had to go? Because Jesus was Jewish. And the Jews looked down on the Samaritans. It was, it was a racist thing. He had to go. It was like, okay, he had to go, you know, through the worst part of town. Had to go through there. So this is our Lord. He's going through the bad side of town. And uh, and he comes to a well. The disciples, they go on in town, and, he's, you know, he sits down there, and there's a woman there. It's noon. Why is she there at noon? Have you ever thought about it? Or, you know, it, it's in the day, and it's the hot part of the sun. It's probably because, as we're going to see, she's outcast. She has to live in shame. People don't even want her drawing water at the same time that they do, is what I suspect. Nobody wants to go out in the middle of the desert in the middle of the day to go do hot, heavy work of lifting water and then carrying it home. Water buckets are heavy, aren't they? It's because she lives in a disgrace. She lives in that where, like, people look down on her. And later we find out she's living with a man. And so she's had husbands. And I suspect, I don't know, but I think just from having dealt with so many people that she was a, a, a woman like I described who had been taken advantage of all of her life. So any man that walked up to her, she just naturally would probably assume, oh, he's going to want something and, I'll, and just try to victimize me. So here comes Jesus and he sits down. She didn't know. She didn't know. <laughs> she didn't know it was our Lord. Probably just figured, okay, another victimizer, another abuser. And so he asked her for a drink. He doesn't proposition her. They're alone. He doesn't try to get anything out of her, get over on her, nothing. She's drawing water. And she asked, he asked her for a drink. I don't know if you remember the history of those pictures like down south where like they wouldn't let, there's like blacks and whites. Whites wouldn't drink in the same water fountain. Wouldn't it, you might get contaminated from those black people. Might get black germs. There's a woman that worked with Cal at the hospital. She thought, she thought black people had different organs inside of them. <laughs> so Jesus sits down. So here he is. He's a guy, first of all. So in that, you know, there's status there in that culture. And he's a, and he's Jewish, right? He's a, so all this, and he sits down and he goes, hey, can I have a drink? He didn't, I doubt he has one of those little flexible camping cups. 
He probably, you know, wants to drink out of whatever she's got. Drink after her, right? So this has got to be blowing her mind. It's like, what is going on here? And then what's he do? He has a conversation with her about spiritual things as if they're equals. I hear some people going, well, you know, the Bible, it, it keeps women down and makes them, you know, like they're second and stuff. I'm like, no, this is, this is, women live women, think they invented equal rights. No, they didn't. Jesus came up with it first, and it was powered by love. <laughs> Here he is, he's sitting with a, a racial and gender outca- and an, a social outcast, treating her like an equal. She's got to feel that right you've got to feel that being treated that way with respect he's treating this woman with respect I wonder if she's ever been treated that way these are thoughts that go through my mind the woman at the well and he's alone with her right we're not supposed to be alone with women are we John that's what we're in the ministry they tell you Jesus is alone with her you know why that is it's because our God is wild and free he's wild and free we sang about it earlier I'm not necessarily condoning anything I'm just saying he's wild and free you can't put him in a box you can't put him in a formula I heard a Jason Upton song one of my new favorite ones the title of it is wild and free he says in there my God is wild and free He's not constrained by anybody. Later, the disciples come back and they're like, what are you doing alone with a woman? Looking at her. Surely they probably looked at her with that eye. Oh, and she's one out here at, at noontime. You can tell she's one of those Samaritans. You're out here talking to her alone? What are you doing? He's loving her. That's what he's doing. He's showing her love. He's showing her love. And then, he says to her, oh, well, go, go ahead and call your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. He goes, you're right. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is just quite true. And she says, whoa, you must be a prophet. You're a prophet. And she becomes so amazed she runs into town and she tells everybody, hey, this, this, this man, he's a prophet. He told me everything about myself. You know, they come and they see him and a whole bunch of people get saved. Well, the Lord's moved through me with a prophetic. And I know he has with Chris and uh, Grandma Rita and different ones. I've never had anybody run out of here and Go tell everybody in the city, and a bunch of people get saved. Just think about that. You know what the difference was? Jesus loved her first, and the prophetic flowed out of him in the process of loving her. She wasn't, I don't think she was as struck by the prophecy as she was by the fact of, oh, this guy knew. See, as she's talking to him and and he's treating her like an equal, it would be easy for her to think, he's treating me so well. I wonder how he'd treat me if he knew the life I've lived. I wonder how he'd treat me if he knew what I've done. He didn't know the Lord that she's talking to because the Lord's not like that. And when he told her he knew everything, the whole time he was respecting and loving her. That made the difference. Right? That made the difference. You see, the power, what happened was Jesus sat down and started with love with this person who was broken and lost, with love. And the power of the Holy Spirit, the prophetic that flowed out of it, it wasn't for the sake of the prophetic. It just came out to heal her. It was just an extension of the love. And and if you want your spiritual gift, whether it be prophetic or healing 
or faith or helps, if you want it supercharged, don't try to just use it of its own. I've heard people go, well, I can reach in any time. Well, you can reach in any time, but if you want it to be real with the power of God, start loving on somebody. And then when you're le well, loving them, it will flow out of that. And when that happens, then you'll see real miracles. And haven't you noticed that almost all the miracles that Jesus did had to do with helping, loving, and restoring people? Almost all of them. None of them had to, he could have, you know, had a mountain grow out of the side of a tree or something. It would have been impressive, but who would have been helped? There was a point because it was powered by love. That's how it works. That's what I want to talk, talk about today. Bring that up. So, Joshua. So thinking about that pipe concept, I was driving a van early this morning getting gas, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, after, after talking about this love and the pipe, so we would have an altar call for anybody that wants to be prayed with. You know, if, if, you, if you feel like you got a blockage in a pipe, you know, and things just aren't flowing, and it could be hurt, it could be you're holding on to something, it could, you know, maybe you just want it to flow. You know, if you want to hear God and you want to start, you get your gifts and do miracles and stuff, start, just start with the love and let that stuff happen. It's not something you have to muster up or figure out. You spend time with the Lord and listen for him. The rest comes. But if you got a clog in your pipe, get some Holy Ghost Drado. <laughs> Bob and I and Joe and whoever wants to come up here, let, let's all just start praying together. And if you would like any prayer... Come on up here. Come on up here and, and let's just pray together with each other and for each other today. Desire, living 
know how high, how deep, how wide is love, love, love. We want to know how high, how deep, how wide is love, love, love. We want to know how high, how deep, how wide is love, love, love. We want to know how high, how deep, how wide is love, love, your love. more